So, welcome back everyone. Thanks for coming back to the room to join my talk about VXLAN. I want to give you a brief overview um, over VXLAN. Some of you might have heard about it, some not. It's technology coming from the data center um, space. And it's mostly about the terminology here. And um, Nico from Falscom is afterwards talking a bit about the how to operate a VXLAN network. So, first of all, let's talk a bit about um, the architectures. If you talk about something like VXLAN, you usually start with, uh, with an underlay and an overlay network. The underlay is essentially the physical network you're building. It has plain IP routing, and you're putting an, uh, an overlay network on top of the underlay network, which is then something like uh, VXLAN or VPLS. So, why would you do something like this? This is for, well, traffic separation, first of all. You can use layer three instead of layer two below. You're minimizing the size of your um, layer two domain, and it's essentially a scalable model. So, in, in this case, you're seeing a leaf spine architecture where you have the spines, you can scale them out, and you can uh, have uh, leaves attached to it. So, in, in this example, here you actually see that the uh, layer two, layer three separation happens in the leaf. A leaf in, can be something like a rack, let's say like that. Also, as we're using layer three in the underlay, we can rely on something easy as ECMP. You don't need to um, put more capacity in if you don't need it or for redundancy reasons. And you can actually just use every single link you, you're throwing between your leaf and your spine. So you're relying on, load to, uh, on, on layer three, layer four load balancing algorithms, which also gives you the possibility to not run into any link polarization you might have on uh, layer two protocols or on MPLS. This brings me then to VXLAN itself. Um, so VXLAN was filed as an RFC and is ratified a couple of years ago. Um, and it has been co-authored by various different vendors, um, including Arista, Broadcom, um, Cisco, VMware. So you see VXLAN not only in network devices per se, but also in, um, well, support by uh, network interface cards, support by hypervisors, for example, um, or by, by Linux distributions. So this enables you to build layer two boundaries, layer two domains across multiple leaves in your network. It's fairly transparent. To be fair, the most important difference to VPLS is first of all, you don't require MPLS, um, but you still have Mac learning. Um, let's go a bit on the, on the basics. And as I said, I'm mostly, for me, mostly important is to talk about the terminology as, as Nico will um, provide a bit more insight um, on the details here. So the layer two overlay network is essentially Mac and IP. You have a layer two protocol, you take ethernet frames, you encapsulate them in, um, in UDP and send them over to the um, remote point where it gets decapsulated. Therefore, you actually are able to scale quite significantly. In terms of the terminology, you might hear the term VTAP more often. A VTAP essentially is a device or a tunnel endpoint which encapsulates or decapsulates VXLAN traffic. This can be a switch, this can be a hypervisor. A VTAP has to know about the other VTAPs who are participating in the same layer two domain. Then we have the virtual tunnel identifier, which is essentially the IP interface where the VXLAN traffic is distinct or sourced from. And this IP sits in the underlay network. So it's used for the communication 
to the other VTABs. We also have the virtual network identifier, VNI. If you think of a VNI, it is something like, well, similar to a VLAN, but you have a 24-bit field. So you can do, what is it, 16 million um, potential VNIs instead of just 4,096. So as you can see, this scales way more than just using regular VLANs. Also important to mention, if you have a VNI and a VLAN on the other side, you can have, I think we have it here, yeah. We have VLAN 10 on the left side, then we encapsulate it into a VNI in VXLAN and break it out again into VLAN 10. Those two VLANs do not need to be the same on both sides. It can be, but there's, well, if you already have VLAN 10 in use on the, well, on, on router 2, um, it can be VLAN 20. VXLAN does not really care about the VLAN ID in this case. And you're still able to have one single layer to domain. So how does a VXLAN frame actually look like? You have a well, regular Ethernet header, um, and you're adding some VXLAN information on top of that. So we're having the VNI as a 24-bit field, we're adding a UDP header, we're adding source IP of the um, local VTI, virtual tunnel interface, and the um, remote VTI of the remote VTAB. And then um, also adding um, the regular switching fields on top of it. The really cool thing here is that as it is UDP, it's pretty easy hashable on the IP links you have towards your spines or towards other interconnected, um, uh, well, the interconnect towards your backbone if you have more than one link. This significantly brings down the, uh, the link polarization, as I mentioned before, and you're able to scale to quite a significant number. The entropy itself is um, generated from a hash inside of the uh, from a hash of the inner frame on the UDP side. So you're actually not looking into the uh, into the payload in this case, but you're only looking into the encapsulated um, VXLAN IP packet. So you can um, have the entropy, and you don't need to play around with something like entropy labels to pr to actually get the entropy for the link. Um, for the link caching and the, uh, the ECMP. Um, on, a, on the control plane options, I'm only mentioning a very few briefly here, as this is more like a lightning talk. Um, EVPN is just a data plane protocol. It takes packets, it encapsulates it, it sends it somewhere, it decaps it, and that's it. Uh, what's actually going on on top of it is a whole different story. You can have a controller-based model, the classical SD, SDN approach. Um, this can be VMware NSX, this can be OpenStack. Um, whatever you have in your network can take the, uh, the controller role in this particular case. You can have something like an IP multicast control plane. Uh, where the VTAP joins a multicast group um, because you have to make sure that the bump traffic broadcast unknown, uh, unknown uh, multicast traffic is uh, distributed across all your VTAPs so that you have some kind of Mac learning. It's like this classical uh, who has Mac XYZ. Um, it's somewhere over there in your network you have to get this information somehow. So this is how you have bump traffic for the first few packets. It's essentially flood and learn via multicast. Um, this has kind of limited deployments, and a lot of vendors are actually migrating away from it because they're using head-end replication. Head-end replication is similar to the IP multicast control plane, but using unicast instead. 
So you have to actually specify hard code in your config or, or whatever um, the VTAPs you have in your network and potentially the VNIs attached to it. Therefore, it is a fairly static setup, but it's also the most fault tolerant you can have. And for the more advanced users in the, in the data center space, they're actually using eVPN as a control plane for VXLAN. So eVPN carries the, um, the MAC to IP bindings um, between the VTAPs and makes sure that broadcast is handled in the most efficient way. That's it. The question slide I would just skip for Nico. We do a combined Q&A session in the end um, to not steal more time from him. <laughs> and yeah, thank you for your time.